ceremony today. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very glad if you open the camera over this webinar session. You will have the opportunity to submit the text questions today presented by typing your question into the chat Zoom box. You may send in your question at any time during the presentation. We will collect this and address them during the question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Dr. M. Toyibi, MS, as the field bus secretary, the Director of Global Development at English Corps, Michelle Avelena, Benjamin Cook as the speaker today, Mas Pratama Adi as the moderator and all the enthusiastic participants. In this webinar, we have two agendas. The first agenda is the opening session and the second is workshop session led by our moderator. Well, we are now in the opening session. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. M. Toyibi, MS, as the FILBA secretary, as the representative of the head of FILBA to give speech and open this event. For Dr. Toyibi, the time is yours. Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar organized by Vilpa in collaboration with the British Council today, October 29, 2022, with the topic, Five Key Steps to Building a World-Class CFR Test. My name is Mama Taibi, as Houdini has earlier introduced, uh, WTA Secretary of Vilpa. I am currently representing Pa Joko Priyono, the head of Vilpa, who cannot give a speech because he has other activities at the same time. Therefore, allow me to convey his apologies for his absence from this webinar. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the British Council for initiating this webinar by providing the necessary human resources. Let me extend my deep appreciation to Mr. Benjamin Koch for the presentation of the topic. Ladies and gentlemen, FILPA is an association of language service institutions from various universities in Indonesia, both public and private universities. FILPA was founded in 2018, and until now, FILPA has official members of about 80 institutions throughout the country. FILPA organizes various activities, especially workshops related to the main functions of language service institutions, which includes uh, language training, translation, and testing. Therefore, the topic of this afternoon's webinar is very relevant to Vilpa's concern, especially in relation to language testing. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope this uh, webinar will be useful for us especially in helping our efforts to develop language testing measurement. Thank you once again for your participation and have a good webinar. Haikul Kalam, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Toyidi. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to hear the greeting from the Director of Global Development at English Corps. Please welcome Michelle Avelena. Hi, Miss Michelle. Hi, Ibu. Thank you very much, Ibu Dini, for the wonderful welcome. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you for so very much for having us here. It's such a wonderful opportunity um, for for all of us to be here together, um, meeting on a Saturday. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to say a big thanks to the Filba. Uh, organizers for uh, helping us and working very closely with us together today to put up this event together. Um, there's a lot of hard work that goes into this, so uh, a big thank you to everybody that was involved in creating this. Um, I think everybody here would know that uh, we're very proud to be present at FILBA, uh, which I honestly think is just one of the most prestigious associations uh, in Indonesia. 
And the past year and a half, we have had the opportunity to meet with many of you um, and work very closely with a lot of you. I see here Ibu Devi from uh, Ubaya, uh, Ibu Agnes, uh, Ibu Hasnani, and many others uh, that I cannot uh, name uh, one by one, uh, but we have worked very closely and we have uh, uh, had the wonderful opportunity to speak to over 200 of head of language centers across Indonesia. Um, I'd like to say that uh, out of our experience and our conversation, uh, it is very clear that language centers play a very important role for the development and standardization of foreign language development at the university. Your work to qualify, improve, and also deliver both training and testing are very important to the success of your university, but also your students. So uh, a big thank you again to all of you for always striving very, very hard, always looking at the next best solution, asking us uh, the difficult and important questions. Um, it, is it is really through your hard work and also your um, relentless uh, in really helping us, uh, helping your students to uh, move forward um, and very impactful for, for your students. Uh, today, I'm here not only with uh, uh, my Indonesia team, but also with our senior assessment manager, Ben Cook, who will be delivering uh, his talk on five key steps to building a world class EFR test. I'm sure uh, this has been uh, a topic that's interesting and um, also uh, quite popular with head of language centers. Um, I hope that you enjoy the talk. Uh, please feel free to ask uh, Ben um, many questions, um, and we look very much forward uh, uh, to your feedback and to the discussion uh, that we have today. Uh, finally, at, from all of us at English Core, uh, we're very proud to be working with so many of you. In the past year, we've had more than 73 universities that have joined um, English Core as a partner program, and we have worked with many employers, including uh, Pioneer Indonesia, um, EcoCare, many hotels around Indonesia, um, as well as Sekolah Bahasa Polri and Pusat Pendidikan Infanteri TNI AD. Um, really important uh, universities uh, across Indonesia and organizations. Um, so thank you very much for the cooperation. I hope you enjoy the webinar today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miss Michelle. Such a warm greeting for us today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the next agenda is virtual photo session. So for all the participants, please open the camera. Okay, maybe Mas Fahmi yeah, okay. can help us. So I'll take the picture. Mm -hmm. okay. Please uh, kindly turn your camera on, Bapak Ibu. Wherever you are now. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I count to three. It's already in my screen now. Okay, one, <coughs> two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay, is it enough, Mas Fahmi? Yes, <laughs> it can become one screen, so I think it's okay. Okay, <laughs> well, here we come to the main session, but before it, I will read uh, the CV of our moderator today. Wait, I would like to share screen of the CV. Well, our moderator, his name is Pratama Adi, yeah or we can call him Mastama. Yeah, he is manager at Language Training Center, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Yogyakarta. He has many experiences here yeah, as language uh, training center, uh, as manager in Language Training Center, Universitas Muhammadiyah, Yogyakarta since July 2018 until now as academic manager, self-access center coordinator and international corporations, scheduling coordinator, talkative English, House English Instructor, Realia English House English Instructor, and the educational background. Mastama was graduated from Universitas Sanata Dharma Yogyakarta, and for the bachelor degree, 
He was graduated from Yogyakarta State University in 2009. Well, so now please welcome Mas Tama, Mas Pratama Adi. Mas Tama, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, Bu Dini. <clears throat> yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you can hear my voice clearly. And then, uh, first of all, my name is Pratama Mahadi, as already mentioned by Bu Dini. I'm from Language Science Center in the of Mamadi, Jakarta. And I will be moderating this webinar today. The topics of today's webinar is five key steps to building a world class CFR test. A collaboration between uh, Forum Institute Lion Bahasa or Indonesian Language Service Institution Forum and British Council English Corp. Today's presenter is Pak Benjamin Cook, uh, Senior Assessment Manager of British Council English Corp. And then we surely hope that he can share some insights about how to develop a good language proficiency test. Okay, before that, hello, Pak Ben. Hello, hi. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you too, Pavin. Okay, before we go to the main session, I would like to read some of uh, his outstanding CV and his professional experience. Uh, as we know that Pak Ben is now in as a senior assessment manager for the English core, and then previously he worked as a Senior Manager Assessment Development for Pearson and then English Language Assessment Manager as well. And uh, he already worked for uh, previous council as well. Okay, so there are several uh, professional experience that uh, I've been already uh, experienced. Yeah. And then the education. Uh, for the education uh, experience, he was graduated from the University of Manchester uh, for his master degree for TESOL and educational technology, and then uh, language link for the certification of CELTA, and then uh, he was graduated from University of London for his bachelor degree or Hausa and Development Studies. Okay, uh, before we go to the presentation, I would like to have a few notes. Uh, the first is that today's session is being recorded and to be available for viewing uh, post-conference. And then the second one, if you have any question for the presenter uh, before the question and end session, of course, this is the chat feature in this uh, Zoom webinar. Then the, the question will be responded by the presenter after the, uh, the session, I mean, after the presentation session. The allocation of this presentation is about one to one and a half hour, uh, or maybe less. As the presenter finishes the session, we will move to the question and answer session. And then for the Q&A session, we will divide the session into two, so with each a strict question. We can have more questions if time permits, of course. Now let's move to the main session. But ben, are you ready? I am, yes. Yeah, okay. Then the fifth floor floor is yours, Fabian. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for the very for the warm welcome and, and just inviting me to talk to you today. Uh, very excited to to share the the presentation today on, on building a CFR test. Um and yeah, great to be great to see you on all on screen. Um I have many happy memories of spending time in Indonesia. Um as a as a student, I travelled a lot through Indonesia and, and recently have been and been some things for both work and pleasure. So it's great, great to see you all. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I hope you can all see that. So today we're going to be talking about five key steps to building a world class CFR test. And before we jump in, just a little bit about my about myself. Um, so as mentioned, I'm the senior assessment manager at British Council English School. Um, I've been working in assessment for around the last sort of ten years or so. Um, previously working on a mix of general proficiency English assessments at Pearson, uh, mainly computer delivered assessments. Um, so very much focused on how do we take paper based assessments and how do we put them 
online and ensure that they work in that computer-based environment. Um, prior to working in Pearson, I was based in the Philippines, working on um, a range of different workplace assessments, um, primarily for call centers and contact centers used by multinational companies, um, working in places like the Philippines, but also India and China as companies start to grow there and start to establish um, customer service teams in those countries. Prior to that, I have been a teacher, um, I've worked in a range of different countries or continents, including Africa, the Middle East and Europe, and Asia, um, working in a range of different contexts from sort of very much uh, beginner students teaching um, English learners to, to read and write up to uh, really advanced uh, level students, um, business people delivering presentations around the world. Um, but today I wanted to talk to you about um, how we are using the CFR, how we are taking our English score mobile test and aligning that to the CFR and what are the steps that you need to follow if you want to align to the CFR and what are the benefits of doing that. So I'm going to be talking about sort of three key areas. There's one is just a brief introduction to the CFR. Secondly, why you would want to use the CFR, what benefits does it bring? And lastly, these five key steps that anyone can follow to, to align the assessment that you're, you're building or that you have to the CFR. And then lastly, as mentioned, we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. And it'll be great to, great to hear your questions. So if we start by talking about the CFR, what is it, um, what does it involve? So the CFR is the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages. And essentially it describes language ability, language proficiency. It's used around the world as a global standard for talking about language proficiency. There's a huge amount of documentation around it. Um, it was set up by the Council of Europe several years ago, um, and it can be used not just for English, but for any language. But essentially it just describes what does language look like at different levels. It talks about a whole range of different language activities, including production, so that would be speaking and writing, reception, such as reading and listening, interaction, so back and forth, which might be written or spoken. So at the moment, I'm more focused on spoken production, but once we get into the Q&A, that will be more of an interaction, a back and forth. And mediation. Mediation is a, a relatively new term in the CEFR, and essentially this means things like interpretation or translation, or taking one text and converting that for someone else. So it's working between different texts, either spoken or written, um, and enabling communication in that way. It covers a range of different domains. So we have the personal domain, which is the very familiar, sort of about your family, about your friends, about your job. We have the public, which as the name suggests, is those more public areas, such as in shops, on transport, dealing with public institutions like libraries, governments, we have the occupational domain, which is very much workplace. And lastly, we have education, which is a more academic um, language that's commonly seen in tests like, like IELTS, for example. It uses this system of levels, and you may well be familiar with these levels of A1 up to C2. There are six standard levels, and the CFR started with these six levels, so moving from A1 to A2, B1 to B2, C1 to C2, with C2 the most advanced, and equate that to sort of prof proficient, and A1 at the, at, would be a beginner learner of English. Since these initial six levels, additional levels have been added, so you may have heard of pre-A1, which is the very, very early stages of, of learning a language. And there are also plus levels, so you see A2+, plus, B1+, plus, and B2+. Plus. So depending how you look at it, there are sort of six, seven, or possibly 10 levels. But it started out as these six levels, and these are, are the, the most commonly, commonly known ones. So what does the CFR look like? How is it useful? Um, I think one thing is useful to keep in mind is that we have these levels, these six levels of A1 to C2. 
and then we have these these terms beginner elementary intermediate upper intermediate advanced and proficiency these are sort of commonly what we use as teachers as as assessors when we're talking about levels of, of language learner um, these are not exact labels so for example a2 covers both elementary and also parts of pre-intermediate and similarly b2 would cover upper intermediate and possibly advanced as well but this is just a, a good thing to ha have in the back of your mind if you like to give you an idea of what do these different levels of a1 a2 etc mean in terms of course books or in terms of how we assign students to a, to a class when they start learning the language the cfr then is made up of a set of descriptors um, and there are a range of different descriptors. All of these are available on their website. You can access these. There's a huge amount of documentation, as I say. But to give you a sense of, of what it looks like, I have an example of an A1 descriptor. And I'll just give you a few seconds to have a look at that. But you can see this is very much kind of a, a beginner, uh, a description of a beginner learner in any language, not just English. So they can understand and use familiar everyday expressions that might be introductions, um, saying about where they're from and what they do. They can ask and answer questions about where they live, people they know, the things they have. Again, very much at that beginner level of learning a language. And they can interact with people as long as they talk slowly and clearly. And any one of us who has learned a language ourselves will recognize how important that is when we are talking to people that, you know, they are slow, they make things clear for us. If we look at the other extreme, so if we look at a C2 descriptor, again, you can see the difference. You can see that how that descriptor has changed as you move through these different levels. So a C2 can understand with ease virtually everything heard or read. They can express themselves spontaneously. So without thinking, without planning, very fluently and precisely. Precisely is a, I really like this term. I think that means you can choose exactly the right word. You have a whole range of vocab and you can choose exactly the right word to say exactly what you want to say. And I think the last one as well is really important, more complex situations. So you're moving from those very routine, familiar conversations about where you live and who you know and what you have to far more complex situations such as in, in work or in academia. So as I say, the CFR is made up of a huge number of descriptors covering a whole range of diff different communication skills. Um, and that, that is essentially what the CFR is, and that's how it's used. For the rest of the presentation, I'm going to be talking about why we should use these descriptors and how we can actually use them um, in assessment. So why align to the CFR? What, what value, what benefit does it bring to us? Essentially, we've got these three sort of areas of, of any um, of any learning, right? We have curriculum, so there's the materials, the content that we want to teach. We have delivery, um, and that could be involved in things around teacher, teacher training. It could be the materials that we're actually using, or it could be the learning environment. It could be the classroom. And then we have assessment, and that assessment could be formative, as in it's giving us feedback and diagnostic feedback and helping us to understand our strengths and weaknesses, or it could be summative. It could be making a decision that yes, you have passed or failed a course, or yes, you have achieved this grade um, in this class. So we have these three aspects of learning. If these are disconnected or if these are using different frameworks, then the whole system can fall apart. So for example, if you, are, if you are teaching something in your curriculum, but you're assessing something else in your test, these two won't line, line up. So whatever you're teaching, you're not testing, for example. Or let's say you have a new curriculum that you spend a lot of time developing. If you don't train teachers in the delivery side of things, then again, it's not gonna be well delivered. Um, all that work you've done on your curriculum is going to fall apart if you haven't trained up your teachers. So it's really important that these three aspects of learning are aligned. And one way to do that is to use a CFR that provides a common standard, a common framework across all three aspects, ensures that everyone's on the same page, they're using the same language, they have the same aims, they're looking for the same outcomes, and the CFR is one way to do that. Throughout the presentation today, I'm going to be talking about um, how we can actually do this in assessment. 
And I'll be using examples from our own test, English School. So just to give you a, a brief background of this, it's a global test and certificate of uh, English for employment. We have over 2 million users using our test every year in 150 countries, so it's a global test. And we're partnering with universities, employers, and governments around the world to, um, to encourage them to use it and for students and, and teachers, et cetera, to, to be um, taking this test. We have a range of different tests. We have a core skills test, which is grammar, vocab, reading, and listening. We have a speaking test, which assesses skills like pronunciation, fluency, and communication. And very soon we will have a writing test. We're currently testing that, um, trialing that at the moment to make sure that it works as, as we would like it to, and that we can be confident in the results, and that will be coming very soon. Our test is mobile first, so you can take it through, through your phone. Um, either Android or iOS. Um, and the, the test is suitable for either general use or more workplace English, um, primarily aimed at graduating students as they enter employment. So students who are, or language learners who are 16 plus. And crucially, um, and the reason I'm talking to you today is that it awards a CFR level from A2 to C1. So if we go back to those levels, it's sort of awarding from say elementary up to advanced learners. You'll have a chance um, at the end of the presentation, um, we have a link so that you can actually take the test, experience the test and get a certificate for the core skills test as well. And we'll have that link at the end of the, the presentation. So if we're thinking specifically about assessment, um, we had those things, curriculum delivering assessment, let's, let's talk specifically about assessment. Why align to the CFR? What, what value does it bring? I think, first of all, it gives test takers, teachers, and other stakeholders a way to interpret test results using a common global framework. Every test reports scores slightly differently. For example, in English score, we report from zero to 600. IELTS has a completely different scale. They report from zero to nine. TOEIC will report on a different scale, Versant reports on a different scale. All these different tests are using their own different, different scales when it comes to reporting results. But if we use a CFR, then we can all start to align to a common framework and it gives test takers, it gives teachers a, um, it means they can understand the context of that score. So for example, in our English score test, we report both a number, but we also report on the CFR. And that put that 201 into the context of, okay, this person is A2, that means they are around elementary, um, and therefore I can put them into the right class, or I can hire them for this particular role that I'm looking for, or they can leave the university with a certain standard of English. As well as helping us understand the test results, because the CFR is so comprehensive and so much research has been done into it, there, we can make these principled and valid comparisons between tests. So if you have two people with two different tests, you can actually start to compare the results and say, well, these are, these are learners at the same level, or this one is um, slightly more advanced than the other. But again, it's, it's a framework that's been used around the world, it's been developed by experts, and that means that any comparisons that you do make are principled and valid. And lastly, and I think this is probably where the, the focus of um, our time today will be, it's a way to ensure um, assessment quality. Again, a lot of work has been done on this CFR. If we start to align our test to it, it's another measure of quality of your assessment. And that gives confidence to people taking our test, uh, teachers and, and other people using our test, and also employers who may want to accept people um, uh, based on the, the test results. I'd like to share an example of one of our uh, value partners here in, in Indonesia. Um, this is uh, Wilden Isna, head of language center at UNF, UNISKA Kadir. Um, they're currently using English score for their students. Um, as you can see, they, they find real value in, in having an international certificate of English proficiency. And I've highlighted this section there around the value of the CFR description. So as I say, for English score, we report both the, the number, but we also align this, the test is really closely aligned with the CFR. 
and that helps them with evaluating and monitoring um, the English proficiency of their of their students. I'll just give you a few seconds to to read through that. Okay, so let's move on. So we'll move on to the sort of the key topic of, of today's presentation, which was around these five key steps of how do we, when we're building an assessment, when we're creating a new assessment, or even looking at an existing assessment, how can we align this to the CEFR? What's the value of that? We've seen, again, having that global standard really helps test takers and teachers and other, other stakeholders understand uh, both what their, their test means, but also how does that relate to other tests? And it gives you a sense of quality um, and, and validation of your test. There are five key steps. Um, and if I start at the top here, so we have familiarization, moving on to specification, standardization, standard setting, and validation. And I'll talk more about these in more detail and what they look like and, and why they're important. I think the key thing to take away from this slide is that this is very much a cycle. Um, so we, we typically start at familiarization and we move our way through these different, different stages, but it's an ongoing process. Things change. Our assessment may change. We may change. We will change our question, but also our context changes. Who is using our assessment will change. Where it's being used, again, will change. So we need to ensure that we are constantly checking and reviewing and making sure that our test continues to be aligned to the CFR. So this process is, is quite a long, uh, intensive, or resource heavy process, um, but it is well worth doing, but it's also a very much an ongoing process. And I'll return to that at the end of my presentation. So if we start with the very first one, familiarization. And I like to think of this as this, this question of so what CFR levels, skills, and activities are relevant to my context? And that's really important that you have a good understanding of your context. So where are you using this assessment and, and why are you using it? And then you can use the CFR to, to help you kind of refine that. So if we start very generically, and it's a good idea to start at a high level and ask yourself, several questions about my context. So for example, what activities are relevant to me? And by activities, I mean, what are we talking about? Productive skills? Uh, so speaking and writing, are we talking about receptive skills, reading and listening? Is it a combination of those? It might be, it might be using all four, but you're focused more on the speaking side of things. All of that will change depending on the context. So if we think about sort of workplace, employer-based English, um, it'd be a combination of probably all four skills, um, but you may find, depending on the role, that you're spending a lot more time writing than you are speaking. Another good question to ask yourself at this point is, what levels am I working with? Am I dealing with sort of A1, A2, beginner elementary, or am I dealing with much more advanced learners at, say, C1 and C2? And again, you think about the context of my assessment. Do I want an assessment that covers the whole range of the CFR? Do I want to focus on a particular part of the CFR? Do I need two, three, or four different assessments for different levels of the CFR? These are all things you should be asking yourself at this stage. And then last key question is, what domains are suitable? So we talked about domains in terms of personal, public, occupational, and academic or educational depending on the context that you're working in, depending on what people want to use your test for, that's another key question. So at English score, we're very much focused on sort of the occupational domain, um, but at the lower levels, we also use the personal and public domains. Other tests will focus primarily on the, the academic or the educational domain. And again, that really depends on your context. There's no right or wrong answer. It's, it's just important to understand how my test going to be used, um, and what is the value that test is going to bring? Once you've asked you, yourselves those generic questions, you then move into the next stage, which is more specific. You're getting into 
deciding which descriptors, as, as I said, the CFR is made up of a whole bank of different descriptors. That all, these are all available, but you need to go through and decide, well, which ones are relevant? So based on the activities that I've decided are relevant to me, the levels and the domains I'm working in, I need to choose my descriptors. And here's an example of a descriptor, which you might think, yep, that looks, that looks great. I, uh, that's relevant to my context. Um, but then you need to kind of align everyone that um, on what these descriptors mean. So at the, on the surface level, this descriptor looks looks good. Um, I think this is relevant to my context. But we have things here like short narratives. We need to make sure that everyone is aligned and understands what is a short narrative. Is that 50 words, 100 words, 200 words? Again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just important to ensure that everyone is aligned on that and has a shared understanding of what that means. Familiar situations, really interesting question. What is familiar? Familiar to me might be very unfamiliar to you and vice versa. So we need to make sure as part of this familiarization that we have a shared understanding of what familiar actually means. High frequency everyday language. Okay, now this feels like quite a low level. If we're talking about high frequency everyday language. We're probably talking about A1, A2, but again, what is everyday language? That will depend on the context. And high frequency, again, depends on the context. So it's really important that um, whatever is in the CFR, that we just don't take that and use that um, without reviewing it and thinking, well, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for my context? Um, A2 in one context may look quite different to A2 in a different context. But the key thing really for this stage is to understand the situation that you'll be using your assessment, get a, a detailed understanding of that, and then go through the CFR and start to look at, well, what descriptors fit that context? Once you've decided that, and that, you know, it, it, it's quite a short, well, I presented it in quite, quite briefly, but it's quite a detailed stage. It requires quite a lot of research into your context and quite a lot of work with other people to make sure that you are aligned. But once you have done that, you then get into the kind of, I think, the most exciting part, which is what does that mean for my assessment? How do I design my assessment to, to reflect that work that I've done and understanding my context? And I'm going to use the example of reading. Um, I, think I quite like uh, looking at reading. I think there are lots of different things within reading that you can really unpack and, and talk about, um, particularly in this context. So we could talk about sort of reading skills. You know, we, as you all know, you know, you have local reading skills, which is reading very much at the word and sentence based level, so reading for detail. But then you also have global reading, which is understanding the whole context of the of the text. Uh, this might be questions of, sort of how does the writer feel about a particular topic or what would be a good heading for this particular text? OK, so it's good to think about this is all particular to reading, but what am I doing? Am I doing local reading, reading for detail, or more global general reading? Expeditious versus careful, expeditious. So am I doing fast reading? We typically talk about this as teachers as sort of skimming and scanning. You know, we're always telling our students to, to skim and scan for certain words in reading. That would be an example of expeditious reading. Or am I doing very careful reading? And that'd be reading for detail and understanding the, the finer detail, the finer nuance between um, different viewpoints in a text, for example. With an English score, we want to make sure that we are covering all these reading skills. Okay, so we want to be testing both local and global reading, expeditious and also careful reading. The domains. So for English score, we have focused primarily on the occupational domain. But as I say, at the lower levels, where perhaps um, our test takers don't have the language to to work so well in occupational domain, we also bring in some personal and, and public um, domains as well. And then we have our CFR descriptors. You know, as mentioned, there are a whole range of different descriptors in the CFR. Here are some of the ones that we have selected for English scores. So we're looking at overall reading comprehension. We've decided, well, let's use the descriptors that talk about reading instruction. So there's a whole set of, of descriptors that talk about what people can do or how they read instructions at different levels. Reading instructions feels like a really good sort of occupational um, domain uh, descriptor. This is something that our test takers will need to be doing 
in the workplace. Um, that might be instructions about how to operate machinery. It might be instructions about how to um, structure a report. That feels like a good reading skill that we should be testing. Reading correspondence, again, super, super relevant to the occupational domain. Um, they'll be dealing with emails, chat messages, um, interacting with different people through, through writing. That feels like a, a good kind of descriptor that we should be including in our test. And reading for pleasure, perhaps less relevant to occupational, but really relevant in the personal and public domains. And the pleasure could be books, it could be newspapers, magazine articles, it could be things that you find online. Um, but again, we wanted to include that in our test. So once you've decided these, you can then start to think about, well, how, what does this look like in practice in my test? How do I design my questions to reflect all these things that I want to do that I want to include based on what I know about my context? And we're going to look at some examples of what we've done in English school. So you'll see a couple of reading questions here. Um, let's look at the first one. This is what we call our gap fill reading type. So you can see you've got some text here at the top and then they have three question options to choose from and they have to choose the right option to complete the text. So as I say, we call this our gap fill item. We think this covers local careful reading. OK, so they're having to read sort of well, what they having to read quite carefully up until this point. He. So that tells me, all right, so there's got to be a verb coming, enjoys, brings, takes. I need to be reading quite carefully to make sure I choose the um, the correct response. We're not asking them to say, um, to look at the whole text and, and come up with a summary of it or anything like that, which would be more, more the local, or very, sorry, the global will be more focused on the local understanding, reading each word, reading each sentence and making sure we understand it. In terms of level, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts, but my feeling is, well, sorry, in terms of domain, this is very much a personal domain, right? So we said personal is sort of your everyday life. This is about John going to the market, what he likes to buy, what he likes to do with the food that he buys. And as mentioned, the level is sort of quite low at A2. So this is around your elementary, possibly pre-intermediate level. And then in terms of descriptor, what does this look like in terms of the CFR descriptor? I think this is a good match. Um, you know, so this is this text comes from the CFR, can understand text describing people, places, everyday life and culture. That feels like a good fit for this, this question, and it's using simple language. Again, I think that, that's about right um, for this item. So in this way, we start to build up, we can start to build links between our question items, sorry, our test items, and the CFR descriptors. And this is another piece that you will need to do as you start to align your test. If we look at another one, drag and drop. So in this case, we have the starting sentence. And then students need to arrange the three following sentences in the right order. So you can drag and drop these three sentences here to make sure that the text is complete and coherent. Now, this is slightly different to the first one. We're looking for local reading. You need to read each sentence carefully, make sure you understand that. But you also need to do some global reading. You need to make sure that the whole thing works together as the text. So these two sentences may follow together, but does that follow with the whole text? Doesn't make sense. So here we're testing both local and global reading, and we're also testing that quite careful reading as well. In terms of domain, this feels a little bit more public. This is not about what I like to do, what someone I know likes to do. This is more general information. So this is more of a public domain. It's not work-based and it's not educational. So it's definitely in that public area. In terms of level, I think both the language in this test item is a bit higher than the one we saw previously, but also it's, it's longer, which then becomes much more difficult for that test taker. So we would say this is around B1. In terms of, so if I think it's B1, I can go back to the CFR and say, well, what descriptor is relevant? And I think this is the, the best descriptor you're gonna find for this item. You can understand the main points in descriptive notes museum exhibits, explanatory boards. This feels like something I might see in a museum, possibly talking about a teddy bear that you might see in a museum, for example. And again, that's building the link between my test items and the descriptors in the CFR. Here's a couple more, um, just to, to show you how this looks like in practice. So we have this item here, which is the gap field title. Um, 
students are given a longer text. This text goes down to probably around here, so around 100, 150 words long. And they need to choose the best title for the text. Okay, so we're not really asking them about the detail of the text, we're asking them what's the best title, what's the best summary of this text. So if we think about the skills in this one, it's really global. We're asking them to summarize this text. So global versus local. Expeditious, in that they will need to read that quite quickly um, to get a rough idea of what the text is talking about. But then they need to go to also into more careful reading detail to select the right option. So you can again see that these reading skills, they're not exclusive. You'll be doing a range of these different reading skills as you attempt different items. Again, this is, um, I think, public. This feels like a news article, something that you might read in a magazine or a newspaper or online. And again, we're moving up those levels. So this is B2. So this is moving into the upper intermediate. You can see that the text is much longer. The vocabulary level is much higher. Um, and that's why we're moving up the CFR level. But again, having that, that CFR level descriptor um, gives us, aligns us all. We can all say, well, this is B2. And this is the descriptor that I think it most closely matches, I think, here, content and relevance of news items on a range of topics. I think that's a good descriptor. And again, that starts to build that alignment between the item and the CFR. Lastly, we'll look at triple long reading. Um, which is a much longer text. It's sort of 250 words, so it comes down to about here on the page. Um, and we're asking the question of what is the author's overall viewpoint? I love these types of questions um, because, you know, there will be no one word, there'll be no one sentence that you can point to and say, that's the answer. You have to understand the whole text. You have to understand the wall. How does the writer feel about it? What, are they, what language are they using to demonstrate their feelings and their opinion? So there's both global reading, but also careful reading. You need to get a sense of how do they feel, but also you need to look for the details within the text. This is definitely occupational. So we're moving from the personal, the public, to the occupational domain. And here we've got change of challenges and management, business executives. This is definitely workplace English. And this is much, much harder. So with C1, we're moving into more of the advanced learner area. In terms of descriptor, professional, finer points of detail, including attitudes and implied as well as stated opinions. And that feels like a really good fit here. Um, so our question was, what are the author's overall viewpoint? And we're asking, you know, we've got here around implied as well as stated opinions. This is an example of how you start to connect your, your item types to the CFR. And if you've got an existing test, um, you can do this, but also if you're developing a new test, I mean, as we were at English score, you can do this from the very beginning. I mean, you're writing your items, you start to building those links, you're starting to look at what does the CFR say, what does the CFR recommend, how can I use that when I build my items? That was our second stage. If we move into our third stage, which is standardization. And I, I like think this is the question of how do I know what level the questions are at? I have said previously, you know, this is a B2, this is a B1, but how do we know that? How can we be confident in that? Um, it's not enough just for me to say that. We need to have confidence that everyone agrees on that. And we need some kind of reference, we need some kind of review process um, to ensure that, that that is happening consistently and accurately. There are a few different things we can do around that. Um, and I've talked through a few things that we do at English School to ensure that. One is our item writers. Um, it's really important that the people writing the, the questions, uh, writing the items in your test, have experience in using the CEFR. Um, now that experience could be through working in assessment, um, but also teaching, uh, teaching experience is hugely important, understand the, the challenges that students have, um, what different levels look like in different contexts. I think that's the second thing here is understanding the context we go back to our first stage familiarization, it's really important that the people writing the test have a really good understanding of the context as well, because that's going to be important in, in how they write the items and how they link to the CFR. Now your, your question writers might have all that experience, they might know the context really well, they still need to be trained and aligned on the CFR. The CFR has a great set of descriptors, but we still need to make sure that we all agree on what they actually mean. 
So as part of that training and alignment with your writers at English School, we review the CFR descriptors. Um, we make sure that we understand them. If we go back to my earlier slide of, you know, we had that example of a short narrative. What is short? What does that look like in practice? Um, another really interesting um, activity, I think, is self-assessment. So if you speak another language um, apart from your own mother tongue or L1, um, is to kind of self-assess your own language using the CEFR. And that's a really good way to get familiar with the descriptors. Um, I don't have huge language skills, but for example, with French, I could go and look at descriptors and I might rate myself as sort of a B1 speaker of French, for example. And that's a really nice way to put yourselves in the shoes of the learners and understand um, what you can and can't do at the different levels. And another key piece of the training and alignment process is to review existing materials um, and say, well, you know, what level did we assign to that? Why did we assign that level of A2 or B1 or whatever it might be? Um, and you use that to, to check us understanding amongst your item writers. So that's one way that you can kind of in, ensure the quality and the standardization um, when it comes to aligning the CFR. Thankfully, that's that's not the only thing we do. Um, there are also a huge number of tools online that you can use to use this uh, to, to align with the CFR. The ones that we commonly use at English School are English vocabulary profile, English grammar profile. Um, and again, if you if you look online, you'll find these. Um, this re represents a huge amount of work done after the CFR was first established to align um, English vocabulary to the CFR. So you can look up any individual word and see what level it is on the CFR. So whether it's A2, B1, et cetera, and the same with grammar. So for example, you can look up comparatives and that might tell you, well, that's typically taught at A2 and therefore you can teach it. Uh, I'm sorry, you can test it in an A2 test, for example. Whereas if you look at passives, that starts at A2, but it starts to move into B1 and even B2 with the more advanced forms of passive, um, passive tenses. The really useful tools um, to be looking at specific words. In the context of reading, um, we have a tool um, which again is available online called Text Inspector, really interesting, super powerful tool. Um, and again, it's available online if people do want to use it. Um, I'll show you an example of what that looks like. Um, so I have this text, let's say this is a reading text that I would like to use in my test. This feels like uh, probably an occupational type text. So we're thinking about those domains, personal, public, occupation, educational, this feels like possibly, probably occupational. But as an item writer or as a test, uh, as an assessment manager, I want to know well, what what level is this? I mean, I, I think it's a certain level, maybe another item writer agrees with me or they disagree. Is there a tool that we can use um, to help us make that decision? So if we put it into text inspector, we get a whole range of reporting, but this is probably a nice clear snapshot of the kind of reporting you get back. Text inspector looks at that test and says, well, most of the words in this text are A1, around 60% of the words are A1, okay? So beginner. About 30% of the words are A2, um, and not many, probably five, four or five percent of the words are at B2, and a few it doesn't quite know, doesn't recognize them. So it gives you this report. Um, and that gives me quite a lot of useful information. I think, well, actually, uh, it's not surprising that we've got a large number of A1 words, given that you know things like is and she and have and so on are going to be A1. But A2, that looks like, you know, that's quite interesting. My feeling is sort of colleagues, uh, busy, moment, uh, possibly later. These feel like A2 words. So I think I could use this text in an A2 item. And I think this is another way to build that link and kind of uh, validate what you think. I think the key thing with text inspector is not to rely on it so much that it overrules all your experience, all your expertise that you might have in your item writers or all that work that you've spent uh, looking at the descriptors. It's another tool that you can use. It's another, um, yeah, another resource that you can rely on. If we look at a, a much longer text, um, so again, you think, well, this is clearly going to be higher than A2, but how much higher is this a B2, C1, C2? Um, can, I, can I get a sense of that? So again, if you put that into text inspector, you get a report like this. Again, understandably, a lot of words are A1, given that you've got a lot of useful, uh, fairly simple words, it is, and so on. Um, 
but you can see you've got words at A2, B1, B2, and even C1 and C2. Um, so this is a much higher level of, of text. It's obviously longer. As an item writer, you'd be looking at this, you'd be using your own expertise, you'd be working with other item writers, and you would probably place this in around B2. Um, so again, a really useful tool to, um, to help you make these decisions. But as I say, I think it's just one tool and you need this, you need these whole range of different tools and expertise to, to make these decisions. One last thing that you can do as part of your uh, standardization, as part of your ensuring that what you decide for an item, if you decide an item is A2 or B1, um, is part of your review process. So this is how we develop items at English School, um, and I'll walk you through it. So we start by having an item writer, experienced item writer, write the item, and they will assign a CFR level when they do that. So say, I've written this item, I think it is A2. It then goes into peer review. So other item writers um, will review that item. Two other item writers will review that, and they will give comments back to the item writer, say, yeah, I agree with you. I think this is A2. Or no, actually, I think this is more of a B1 based on my experience, based on my understanding of the context, and here's why. And the item writer then takes that feedback. So you've got two other people looking at that item and giving them feedback. It then goes into what we call discuss, yes or no. If the item writer is happy with it, if the two peer reviewers agree with it and they think, yes, we agree with what the item writer has written, we agree that this is a native item, it can go through and it goes into our next stage of item development. However, I would say 20 to 30% of the time, people don't agree. And that's absolutely fine. Everyone has different experience. Everyone is using um, slightly different understandings of the context, and we need to discuss it further. So we'll go into what we call panel review. And this is where the whole item writing team, um, supported by my, myself, such as the assessment manager, will look at these items. Um, and we, we have a discussion. We may spend um, half a day, a whole day, looking at items and reviewing them and, and trying to understand, well, what level is this item? How does that align to the CFR? Um, and as a result of that panel review, we may say, fine, we accept it. It is A2, and it can go through. We may say, well, it needs a bit more work. It needs to be changed. It's too easy. It's, it's not suitable for A2. We need to make it more difficult, and the item writer will make the changes, and then it will come back into review, and we'll review those changes, and then we will sign it off or not. We may say, this is not going to work. Um, this item cannot work at this level. Um, now, that may be because of the language, and we can't change the language. It may be because of sensitivity issues that may not work in the particular context that we're talking about. Um, you know, if we go back to the very early stages, we talked about how important it is to understand your context and make sure that your test items reflect that context. So it may go into the reject pile, um, and we may say, well, we can't use that item, but that's done. But again, this whole review process is really important as part of your standardization. Um, that we all agree and align on what that, that means, what the, the CFR level means, and, and how we can actually ensure the quality of our items all the way through the process. Our fourth stage is standard setting. And this is, um, this is quite different to the other ones, I think. This involves numbers, lots and lots of numbers, lots and lots of statistics. Um, it's quite a lengthy, involved stage, requires quite a lot of um, time and effort to, to, to implement, but really valuable in terms, to, uh, in terms of aligning your test to the CFR. Essentially, it's how do I report test results in the CFR? So we give you a score. We saw at the beginning that you know, English score re reports, for example, uh, from 0 to 600. But how do we convert that score of 0 to 600 to a CFR scale, A1, A2, B1, et cetera? And to do that, we use standard setting. And you might have different contexts. You know, some tests are, for example, we have a B1 test. Um, and you either pass or fail that B1 test. And if you pass it, great, you are certified as B1. If you fail it, you are not certified. You're probably A2, even A1. But how do we decide what is that pass fail boundary? How do we know that someone who scores 58 is a pass and someone who scores 57 is a fail? And therefore the one at 58 is B1 and the one at 57 is A2. How do we know that? The alternative might be as we do an English score, we give you a score 
zero to 600, but we also give you an equivalent CFR scale. So you can uh, CFR score. So you can see on the, the right hand side, um, if you get to 200, you are A2. If you get to 300, you are B1. And the final result for our score, our, our test taker was 372. And we can say, well, you are B1. But again, how do we know that? How, do we, how can we be confident in that? How can we demonstrate that? And that's where standard setting comes in. It helps us decide those boundaries. What's the difference between A2 and B1? What's the difference between B1 and B2? And what does that mean for our scoring? There are a whole range of different ways of doing this. I'm going to show you one that we've done at English School, which is called the bookmark method. Um, if you're interested in that, we have a report on our website that deep goes into the detail of how we actually do this. Um, and most uh, exam boards, most exam companies will, will do this kind of linking or standard setting activity, but really important for translating your test scores into your CFR. I'm going to walk you through what we've done at English School, which is the bookmark method. Um, this is a very brief overview, but it'll give you a sense of the kinds of things that we're doing. The first thing we do is we analyze questions to decide their difficulty. So there's a range of different sort of statistical tools that you can use to work out how difficult are my items. And you do that using real test data or real test taker information. So you can put your, you can trial your items, you get information back from people who have attempted the questions and you can say, well, that's a really easy question. That's a really difficult question. And we can put a number on that. And we can say, well, the easy ones are kind of at the lower end of the scale and the hard ones are at the higher end of the scale. So that's the first step for this method. Secondly, we then create what we call a book of questions in order of difficulty. So we create perhaps 30 or 40 different questions from easy to difficult. And um, then we align our subject matter experts, so our SMEs. So these are people who are experienced in the CFR, experienced in this method. We do an alignment session, make sure everyone has a shared understanding of the CFR. And then we give them that book. And we ask them to place a bookmark where the CEFR level changes. I'll show you what that looks like. We've got these four items. This is a smaller scale. Normally, it would be sort of 30, 40, 50 items. This is our really easy question. This question is slightly more difficult, slightly more difficult again, and even more difficult. Okay, So you can see that the difficulty number is going up. And my question to the, to the experts would be, some of these are A2. Some of these are probably B1. Where's the boundary? Where does it stop being A2? And where does it start being B1? And so each expert would go through and say, well, based on my understanding of the CFR, based on my experience, based on my understanding of the context, they might say, well, I think the boundary is here. And I think these three questions are at the CFR A2 level. And this one is at the CFR B1 level. Now, that is one person's judgment based on their understanding of the context, on their understanding of the CEFR, and um, the work that we've done to align them. But they are an expert. Great. So we take their, we take their response. That's our first person. They said, well, let's put the boundary here between blue and red. We ask another expert, and they said, well, I think it's here. I think it's... Uh, Slightly easier, 47, 449. And we ask another one, well, I agree with that person. I think it's here. This one, no, you're all wrong. I think it's up here. And you keep asking. You can ask 8, 10, 12 different experts. They're all going to give you slightly different answers. And that's fine. We all have different understandings. So then what we do is we say, well, this is what you all thought. You don't agree with each other. Fine. Absolutely fine. No, no issues with that. But here's what you all thought. And then they present what they think and they challenge each other. Well, I think you're wrong. I think it should be here. No, 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 you're wrong. I think it should be here. And there's a lot of back and forth and that can take half a day, a whole day of discussion um, around working out, aligning each other on this DFR because you know that's really important. Thing, things change and we all have different understandings of the context and so on. Once you've done that discussion, you then say, okay, let's do it again. You understand what each other thinks? Let's do it again. And this is the second time we do it. And you can see they've come much, much closer together, right? So we're all in the same area right now. We've asked the same eight people, the same activity, and they've come much closer together. And again, you may say, well, that's not close enough for me. I want you all to agree. And so we have another round of discussion and we challenge each other and say, well, why did you put the boundary there and not, not in this place? 
and you repeat that process again. And you can repeat the process two, three, four times until you get to the point where you are confident in your results. The key thing here is that you are sharing that, you're discussing that, and you're starting to align and you start to set these boundaries. And the takeaway here is that you know, this black line here is the, the boundary based on expert opinion between A2 and B1. And we can use that information to now convert our test score into our CEFR. That's a very brief overview of what the bookmark method looks like. And there are different ways of doing this, but essentially it comes down to asking experts for their, their opinions based on the CFR, discussing that, challenging that, and eventually arriving at consensus. And you can use that consensus to report. As I say, we have a report on our website, how we've done this for English score. If you're interested in that, it's available online. Um, and there are lots of other methods out there. But I, I, it's a really intensive process. It's a really long kind of resource heavy process. But it is really, really interesting. And, and you very often, all the time, you, you eventually arrive at this consensus. And it's nice to see experts sort of challenging and aligning and gradually coming to that point. Looking at the time, so I am going to speed up a little bit. We've got our last stage, which is validation. My short stage, well, I say short, it, it's short to talk about, it's quite involved to, to actually do. This is how do I demonstrate? that my test is aligned with the CFR. I've done all this work, I've done my standard setting, my standardization. How do I demonstrate that? You need to gather all the evidence you have. So that might be the results from your standard setting. Uh, that might be the, all the research you've done into your context. It could be feedback from the participants. You've seen we've evolved experts and item writers and, and people using the test. I need to gather all that feedback. Um, you may want someone externally, completely externally from your company or from your organization or from your university to review everything you've done. You have to gather all that evidence, you have to document it, present the argument, and also highlight the limitations. So essentially, validation is about sort of demonstrating all the work that you've done in these previous four stages um, to show the links between your test and the CFR. And then once you've done that and presented that and written that up, you need to go, as I said at the very beginning, you need to commit to that ongoing monitoring and review. So if I come back to my five steps, you know, I said at the very beginning, this is a cycle. We've moved through these. You would have spent months, possibly years, doing all these things. You get to the validation, and yes, it starts all over again. You know, things change. So your context might change. The people that are taking the test might change. Your test design might change. So you need to continually um, repeat this process, continually improving the um, way that your test aligns to the CFR. So that, that's the end. That, that's those five steps. Um, as I say, really important to, to follow those five steps if you do want to align to the CFR. The, the benefit of that is that it is a global respected uh, framework for talking about language proficiency. And if you can align your test or align your curriculum to the CFR, it gives you that sense of, well, it's a measure of the quality and the validity of the materials that you've been working on. Um, but it also means that people understand what your test score means around the world. It is a global framework and it's really useful in that context. If you would like to try um, the English score core skills test, um, there is a link here that you can use. Um, you will get a certificate. Um, after you've completed the test, and you'll also receive a certificate of attendance for the webinar. Um, so I will end there and would like to open the floor to questions. All right. Thank you very much for, and for the wonderful and outstanding presentation. Uh, for sure, this is a very beneficial insight uh, for us who is going to develop our own test and, of course, to they evaluate uh, our already established test, right? Okay, um, before we move to the question and answer session, uh, first of all, this is a standard question from Indonesian participants, of course. Will the slide materials available post conference? Just kidding. <laughs> but surely, if it is available, it will be very beneficial for us. Okay. All right, uh, for the first section, uh, we would like to invite the participants to deliver their question. Uh, but first, if you'd like to ask a question, 
please raise your virtual hand and then we will call you for uh, your question and then please identify yourself and the presenter to the presenter and to, to whom you would like to uh, ask the question and then uh, for the other two that you, you can also put your question in the uh, chat feature yeah we have one attention who again yes please Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, moderator Pa Ahdi. Uh, my name is Andrea Nimarentek, and I'm from uh, UPT Bahasa Universitas Samratulangi, Mr. Benku. Nice to meet you. But uh, our institution is also one of the uh, FILMA members. So thank you very much for all of the uh, explanation and uh, knowledge that you have just shared. They are really very precious to uh, especially me and all of us here, I'm sure. But uh, there are several questions that I'd like to ask Mr. Cook in this case. Uh, if you don't mind, probably two or three questions here. I hope it's all right. So um, yeah, uh, dealing with the uh, CEFR, so we already know that um, many institutions around the globe has uh, used the CFR as a point of reference yeah, in um, many curriculum as, um, as well as a, a language assessment particularly. It's like a bit of a panacea maybe, a panacea uh, for uh, um, probably language assessment problem. And um, probably um, it, it is accepted as a given that it has to be followed, maybe. So, um, however, as the name indicates, it is a common, quote-unquote, European framework of reference. So, um, my question is, the first one is, are there uh, possibilities of cultural bias in this case in implementing the, quote-unquote, European framework of reference in uh, the curriculum and uh, assessment in, for example, in our country, Indonesia. I know also that uh, Malaysia uses uh, CFR in uh, their language assessment uh, field of uh, yeah, study. In this case, uh, there, there are uh, studies uh, dealing with that as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, last time when I uh, went to a conference in Malang, if I'm not mistaken, you were also there, Mr. Cook. And... Uh, yeah, there are some um, presentations dealing with it. But uh, I was just wondering if uh, you also know um, studies dealing with the CFR, whether or not uh, the, impl the implementation of um, CFR in countries uh, like Indonesia, ASEAN countries, for example, really uh, appropriate for, uh, you know, our local setting in this case, or probably other, um, are there any other findings maybe that... Um, contradictive to um, our our perception of the CFR framework. So that's um, that's my question, sir. And then uh, the second one is dealing with the um, method that you have just explained when um, dealing with the items uh, of a task, the uh, book more, uh, bookmark, bookmark method, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I was just wondering, there is a particular point there, number three, uh, which is align subject matters with the experts. Uh, um, the experts here, could you please explain, sir? Um, who are the experts that we need to, for example, contact with in order to really make sure that the subject ma matters of our, uh, for example, um, test items are really suitable or um, meet the requirements of uh, CFR? So those are my questions, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Bu Ahdi. Uh, uh, are you going to answer first or we move to the next attendee first? Yeah, are you going to answer first? Yes. Yeah, no, yes. great. I'd okay. be very happy to answer those two questions. Yeah, um, yeah really interesting questions. I, I think the... The question around cultural bias, um, apps, you know, I, I think it's really relevant, uh, really important, um, and I think it's becoming increasingly 
So there's increasing awareness around this topic in English assessment. I think there are two things I'd say about that. One, I think um, the CFR is, I, I think, aware of this um, and they do update their descriptors. And I think going forward, they will continue to do that. So they most recently uh, published a companion volume in 2020, which I think started to address some of these concerns. And I'm sure that there is ongoing work to kind of continue to look at that. I think, like you say, as, as it becomes used more and more around the world, that there are going to be more and more of these questions. I think not just in language assessment and CFR, but generally in English teaching around the world, there's just much more awareness of that. Um, so I think that's one part. I would say, I think, you know, if you go back to the very beginning of these steps, we talked about familiarization and the importance of understanding context. I think, you know, if you're dealing in, say, for example, in Indonesia, the people that will be doing that familiarization are really, really familiar with the context. And as that group, you can decide what you want to take from that CFR. The CFR has a whole range of different descriptors. You can choose which ones you want to use that are relevant for your context. So if you feel that certain sets of descriptors are not appropriate, they don't fit into that culture that you're working in or the use case for your assessment, you do not have to use them. And that's why I think it's really important to do that first stage so thoroughly and you know, move from that generic kind of thinking about where am I using this to the more specific of what descriptors actually mean something to me and my test takers and my, my learning environment, my context. And I think that's one way to address that potential cultural bias. Um, so I think it's it's kind of having both of those. It's um, the CFR as, as an organization is aware of that and will try and address it, but also you, know, you, you can tailor it and you can adjust it according to your context. I think having the right people to do that as well. So you know, having the right experts who understand that context, who are aware of some of the cultural sensitivities of working in a particular context is so important at the very early stages of this whole process. Um, I think the second question around the bookmark method. Um, yes, great question. And I, I kind of skipped over that in my, my rush to finish, but um, I think your subject matter experts um, should, again, it's really the same point around, they should understand the CFR, they should be familiar with the CFR descriptors, but they also, again, need to understand the context. I think I said at the beginning, you know, someone A2 in one country in one context may be quite different to an A2 in a different context or a different country. Um, so your experts should be familiar with the CFR and the context, whether they're familiar with the method or not is not really so important because we can train them to use the method, but you do need a really good facilitator for your training for that, who is familiar with the method themselves. But it's more about those experts being, um, having the expertise in the CFR and the language levels, because like you see, like you saw in that process, it is a judgment and it's their judgment. And although we look at that judgment across a whole range of experts, um, it's important that they, they do understand that. So I think in terms of, of who your expert should be, it's familiarity with the CEFR and a familiarity with the context that you're working in. I hope that answered your, your question. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir Thank you for to that. Adrian. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we move to the second, to Isli, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mas Tama, for the opportunity given. Um, I am Isli, and I am currently in charge as the head of Language Center of Universitas Negeri Medan. And I'd like to greet uh, Paben. Hi, Paben. Nice meeting you virtually. And I am, of course, expecting to meeting you offline with the other British Council principal. On the other occasions, hopefully. Um, yeah, Ben, uh, I believe that it's such an inspiring and honor to listen to your very detailed and complex uh, practical context of uh, building what a word class CFR test is. Um, and I also believe that today's webinar purpose is to raise awareness of how the poor design of language assessment may have uh, like some kind of destructive effects uh, if uh, the test uh, qualities and technicalities are not met, right? Um, 
the question is, can you please share some highlights on how actually language assessment should respond to uh, theoretically, technically, and contextual guidelines? Uh, and of course, in CFR guidelines, so that it will be useful. Um, and I would like also to concern the usefulness on how it is aligned to the task designed with the test items. Let's say, for example, when you are designing a test, you need to decide uh, the section of the test and then the test, uh, the test type and then the number of questions you need to have, like uh, the context, whether you need, like in the listening, whether you need to have a non-native or native speakers, and then what skills you need to assess. So how, how what suggestion are you going to suggest us, recommend us on this? And also the scoring, because just now you say English score uh, using 100, 600, right? And it is, I believe, very uh, distinguished from how IELTS is scored. I think uh, that's all from me. Mas Tama, thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Voiti. Thank you so much. Um, really interesting questions again, kind of um, test design and, and how we how we design a test that's going to be, you know, I think I think it wants to be valid, but also yeah. wants to be reliable and it also wants to be practical. Um, and the challenge is balancing those three sometimes of it would be great to have a super valid, super reliable test, but if it takes you three days to to answer the test taker. No one's going to be interested in that, and that's not very practical. Um, so I think, I think one thing I would say is when you're aligning to the CFR, um, it's an ongoing process in that I don't think anyone would say we get it right the first time. I think you do it once and then you learn things both about your context, about your test, and you say, well, actually, my test doesn't work very well for this particular um, skill that I want to assess. What changes can I make to my test? So then you make changes to your test, and then you have to go through that process again. I think the key thing is, and it's kind of the last thing I said at the end, there was sort of ongoing monitoring and validation. And this is not a one, one stop thing that you do and say, we're done, we're aligned to the CFR, let's go and do something else. I think it really does change. Um, I think your questions, really interesting questions around kind of test design. So you gave the example of, you know, listening, do I use native or non-native speakers? Um, another one that comes to mind is sort of reading. Do I use authentic reading text or do I write my own reading text? You know, those are the kinds of practical questions that as test designers we're dealing with all the time. Mm -hmm. I think the, the CFR can be a huge help in, in helping you make those decisions. So if you look at the CFR descriptors, um, you will see at the lower levels, uh, you know, things like uh, oh. simple language um, is used in reading. If that's the case, you're probably going to be writing your own reading text. But if, you're, if your context is that you're dealing with higher level learners, B2, C1, C2, in an academic um, or educational context. If you look at the descriptors, it will say things like authentic, complex texts. And that those CFR descriptors will inform how you actually design your test. And you may say, well, I want to use text from scientific articles, or I want to use text from um, journals, for example. So I think the, the CEFR can help you make some of those decisions. As again, I think it comes back to understanding the context and that then informs your test design. So it really depends, um, you know, English school was designed as a test for people kind of entering the workplace. Um, and we knew as a result that we wanted um, a range of different accents in our listening test, because we knew that the global workplace nowadays, you know, not everyone is from one country or from one region that when, you, when you're working in a global workplace, you're interacting with people from all around the world um, with a range of different accents. So we knew that we had to make our listening test represent that and reflect that so it could be valid. 
and reliable and practical. Um, there is there is a really useful guide um, that the CEFR has published more generally on kind of test design and test development. Um, and I'd recommend um, if you if you search for that, I think it's called um, test development. If you search for test development in CFR, there is a handbook um, which really breaks down a lot of these questions for you um, in terms of just how do you construct, how do you design a test, what kind of things you need to consider. Um, again, all of that is context context dependent, but it's a really good kind of introduction to those more sort of practical questions around test design. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that I hope that helps. Masnaman, you mind if I add some other? Because I haven't listened. I'm sorry, Ben. How about oh. the scoring? Uh, sorry, yes. thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the scoring. Yeah, interesting question. Actually, I think a lot of the time it's um there's no there's no clear reason or clear rationale. Um it's really what works for what works for you. So if I give the example of English score, we decided on that scale of zero to six hundred. Um for two reasons, right? We 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 assess at A2, B1, B2, and C1. Okay, so that was our four levels. Um, we knew that there's also A1 below that, and then there's pre-A1. So we mm -hmm. wanted to build a scale that reflected pre-A1 up to C1. And that mm -hmm. was six levels. Let's divide them into 600. Okay. But the reason that we went to 600 and not six was because if you look at B2, B2 is really, really broad. You know, B2 covers from kind of low or intermediate, high intermediate up into advanced. B2 is a huge area of language. Okay. It could take you five, six, seven, eight hundred hours even to complete B2. If we can break that down as we do, we say, you know, um, B2 is 400 to 500. Mm -hmm. If we can break that down, if we give you a score of 420, you know what, oh. you're at the lower end of B2. If okay. we say you're 470, we know you're at the higher end of B2. And so we know where you are in your learning journey. And that was a reason why we went for that scale of zero to 600, um, because that is useful information for you as a test taker, but also for teachers, other users, you know, people who want to see the results. You'll be too, but where are you in B2? Are you at the upper end or the lower end? Other tests will have different rationale. IELTS, you know, the example you gave, is used for university entrance. Very often it's uh, just you need to get a seven or you need to get an eight. And it's not used so much for kind of informing um what you need to work on next it's really can you get into the university or not and that's why you can have that you need to get a seven and you're in if you get a six you're not and if you get an eight you are okay i think uh that's all my summer thank you very much ben yeah. thank, thank you very, you. Very, thank you. Cool, very kind and humble expertise setting thank you ben thank you before we move to Bu, we are here. One question related to who is this question, uh, but then, uh, what, what do you think? What, what is your understand when, when we design a test, and then, uh, how can we take the score? We will an A1 question have a lesser point than the C2 question, or should it have the same weight? What do you think about that? Yeah, good, good question again. I think, um it depends on your test design. So for example, if you have built a test, which is A1, and it's a pass fail test, then every question might have an equal weighting. So you might have 50 questions in your A1 test. And based on your standard setting, you know that if you get 30 correct, you pass at A1, if you get 29, you fail at A1. And so therefore you might have um, equal weighting. If it's an adaptive test, um, now, some tests, English score uses kind of a semi-adaptive approach where uh, depending how you do in parts of the test, we start to show you more difficult questions. If you get those wrong, we might show you slightly easier questions. And so we're, we're adjusting the difficulty of our questions. That's another approach where you can um, change the difficulty of the questions that you're showing test takers. And that works well in kind of computer or mobile delivered tests. Um, I think it really depends on your your test design in the context. You know, some questions, um, for example, when you're looking at writing, 
um, you may only have one or two writing questions in a test. If you've asked them to write two or 300 word essays, you don't want them to be doing that 10 or 20 times in test. No one's going to want to do that. So you ask them one or two, but you weight them really heavily. And so that, that question, although it's one question, becomes worth 20, 30, 40% of your marks. Um, so I think it partly depends on test design. Um, I think when you're dealing with um, general proficiency, uh, sort of grammar and vocab, yes, probably equal weighting. Um, but once you move into sort of the productive skills where you can't ask people to be answering 50, 60 questions, or even reading, again, it's quite tricky to do, then you start to weight questions differently. Um, but I think, yeah, it just comes back to how you've set up the test and what kind of test it is. All right, yeah, thank you very much for your perspective. Let's move to the question. Okay, thank you for the time given. Uh, hello, Pak Ben. Uh, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Um, I would like to ask uh, two very, very um, practical things that I encounter in my work. So the first one is that when we make our test items, many of the students have difficulty with the items that are related with culture you know like um for example uh, they they some of them uh, have difficulty with uh, like the first item the first test item that you show us about somebody who is going to the to the market and buying fresh food um that's that's the the not because sorry not because they don't know about the farm the difference between farm and and market but because they don't realize that there is difference between like lunch and dinner and that some parts of the other uh, uh in other parts of the world there are like dinner and supper things like that so so how can we make a test that can what is it uh help to make the test takers get a good result, but also at the same time, uh, not neglecting the cultural part of the language. That's the first question. And the second question, my question uh, is about the bookmark method that you uh, speak, uh, that you spoke earlier, that uh, you said that uh, the the what is it the the expert will then review or repeat the process maybe twice or three times or more maybe now the question is when you repeat the bookmark method processes do you use the same or different material and then why you use that and then if if you use the same materials what made the expert change their opinion the second or the third time around because in my uh, in my opinion if I read the same text more than twice the third time for me it will be easier something like that so can you explain further about that thank you Pak Ben yeah. yes yeah really interesting um so if we take the first question, which was around the cultural knowledge um, and you know, sort of dealing with that, um, I love this topic. I can talk about this for, for a very long time. Um, I think um, there are a few things that you can do to address that. Um, one is you have a really detailed test specification, which lays out what you can and can't talk about um, in your test items. So for example, at English score, we are very aware that we're develop a global test and it needs to work in all the different countries, the 150 plus countries that we're in. Um, so that means excluding, well, for example, specific UK based questions that re may require knowledge of the UK. Um, we also ensure that we're not going to be relying on specialist knowledge. You know, if you're dealing with a workplace or English for the workplace, you need to make sure that someone who has no experience in the workplace, if they're graduate just leaving university, 
Um, they may not have ever worked in an office before or ever worked for a company before. How can we ask them to be answering questions that require that knowledge of working in a company? So that's part of our specification, what we can and can't ask, but also our item writers receive training in that. So they, we make them very aware of the context and what we should and shouldn't do. If we go back to that item review process, you see we're having three, four, five, six different people reviewing the items. And they'll be looking at things as well as you know alignment to the CFR. They'll also be looking at that. Is it culturally appropriate? Does it work in the context that we're writing these items for? Do they need specialist knowledge? Um, it's always going to be difficult when you write a global test to find something that works for everyone. Um, and that's why some of those tools um, that I showed you around Text Inspector and Vocab Profiler are also useful because they are based on global research that has been done in a whole range of different countries to understand that, for example, market is A2 in the countries that we're working in. And that, that's, again, a useful bit of information to make those decisions. Um, I think, um, yeah, so I think having special, you know, experienced writers is another big piece of this that are familiar with some of the, the issues. I think, the, you know, the, the other thing that you can do um, if you have the resources and the time is to actually trial some questions. Um, so you can build a small bank of say 10 or 20 questions um, and actually try those with some, some test takers and, and get their feedback. And if you do find that there are issues around, you know, the example there is a really interesting one, market versus farm. Um, how do we, yeah, you, you, then you, you learn that through, through your, your trialing. Um, you know, we have in English score, we have a whole range of different people from around the world um, working with us, working for us. Um, and, you know, we, we still have disagreements about US versus U, UK English, what is correct and what is not. And so we have, we have a style guide that we use in-house for how to talk about certain things and that just aligns everyone. It's, so it's, um, yeah, it's a case of kind of being explicit of what you can and can't do, but I think trialing is a really useful um, way to, 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 to deal with this. Um, in terms of your, your second question around uh, the bookmark method, so it was, do they see the same thing, see, see the same materials again when we do it the second time, third time? Uh, short answer is no, they don't. We give them a fresh booklet, fresh items so they've not seen these before, um, and then they have another go. Uh, which is good because, the, like you say, if they see the same item two, three, four times, um, that's going to change their perception of the item. So we want to ensure that we give them new items. Um, because all the items have been written to the same specification, we can make comparisons between them. And if they say A2 is here in this booklet and A2 is here in this booklet, we still can make comparisons. It doesn't matter if they're not all the same material. But yeah, really important point that they should be seeing fresh material each time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, happy to answer your question. Yeah, uh, any other questions from the other participants? We move to the second section of question and the session. Mas Pratama, I think I have uh, yeah. one questions that I have okay. already shared in the chat box because I don't want to have more and more questions. <laughs> yeah, we're waiting for the yeah. other participant to ask the yeah. question. Maybe I'm we can do other yeah. <laughs> question. <laughs> Thank you, Master. Thank you, yeah. Babe. Thank you, Wesley. Let me read the question from Bu uh, If I may, I would like to listen to your point of view on the current global situation where each country is not competing to develop a new English language test to be implemented either domestically or globally. Like in Malaysia, we have MOEP, yeah, uh, Malaysian University English Test, yeah, and the latest is Duolingo, which has become one of the best recognized by our education ministry and the most later English star. How, how do you think, what, what do you think about this part then? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, again, another really kind of interesting, challenging question. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it, it's two things about this. One is just going back to the the previous person who's talked about um, you know cultural sensitivity and the importance of culture when it comes to writing tests. You know, I think if you see more and more tests being developed locally, um, either domestically or, like you say, kind of more globally, 
Um, this could be one way to address that cultural cultural sensitivity issue. However, I, th I think you know this is why the CFR is so important because it is that global standard. And although you may have all these different tests being developed, all these different assessments um, being developed, if we're all aligning to the same framework, that gives us both confidence in the kind of validity um, and reliability of that test, um, but also allows comparisons between the tests. Um, so I think, you know, there's, you know, people will develop tests, countries will develop their own tests, but I do think we need that overall framework to ensure that we're all talking in roughly the same way about assessment, um, although the specifics may be different. And again, I come back to my, my point around context is, is key in this, um, that if we're all using the same framework and that framework is valid and reliable in itself, then at least we can start to compare and evaluate these different tests. And you know, some tests will be um, more valid than others. Some tests will be more reliable. Some will be more practical than others. And all these, these issues around test design. Um, but if we're using the same framework, it's important that we, we align on that framework, but not only just looking at assessment. You know, we, we may have an assessment, but how does that fit into our curriculum? Does it reflect what we teach in our curriculum? Does it reflect the needs of our test takers? If we develop a test which tests workplace English, um, but ask them to write a letter, and yet when they go into the workplace, they're using email and they're using chat, that test doesn't is not a good fit, right? We're asking them to write a letter, and yet they never will never write a letter in their lives. So how useful is that test? Um, so you know, those are the kinds of questions we should be look we should be asking ourselves when we're when we're looking at all these different tests coming up. Is it relevant? Is it practical? Is it valid? Um, and is it reliable? And I think the CFR is a big part of that. It just gives you that extra sort of additional quality um, and validity reassurance. I hope that answers your question. Indeed, it is. Thank you very much, for Ben. Thank you, Masama. Any other questions? Mas Pratama, can I ask a question? Yeah, please do, Rina. Yeah. Mm, I would like to know whether uh, assessing uh, speaking must be based on uh, spoken material. In other words, can we test or can we assess uh, speaking ability from listening only? Thank you. Um. Yeah, another interesting question. I think um, I think you do need to test spoken production when it comes to speaking. Um, you may well find that it correlates closely with listening. In that, I think someone who you know has good listening skills may well be a good speaker as well. Um, but I don't think you can guarantee that. So I do think you need to to actually assess spoken production. Um, how you do that will again depend on your context. Um, you may decide to do that. Um, through a conversation with an examiner in an exam room, um, and there's that back and forth and interaction. You may decide to do as we English as we do an English score that it's uh, you know speaking to to your phone, um, and we we collect your spoken responses like that. Um, but I do think it's important that if you do want to an award a score for speaking, that you do actually ass assess that spoken um, production, although. You know, as I say, I fully expect that there'll be a close correlation between listening and speaking, and probably also a very close correlation between grammatical and vocab knowledge and speaking. But we we also know, right, that um, you know some some students are very good at uh, grammatical and vocab knowledge. You know, if you give them a grammar grammar test, they can do amazingly well, um, getting ninety, one hundred percent of the questions right. But if you ask them to say something, they really struggle. And likewise, um, people who are can talk a lot, very fluent, um, and talk, you have a really great conversation, may not know any of the grammatical rules or the appropriate vocab to use, but they can actually talk for a long time. And I know in my experience as a language learner, um, depending how I've learned a language, so I learned French at school, I know the grammatical rules inside out, well, not inside out, but I'm fairly confident with them. Um, but if I go to France, and I want to speak to someone, it's quite a challenge because I didn't do much speaking in my French class. Vice versa, when I've been living in, in different countries, so for example, living in, in the Philippines, um, I was able to, to speak Filipino every day. I was able to talk to the taxi driver, to the person in the shop in Filipino, 
But if you ask me any grammatical rules, I have no idea. And so I think that's why it's important to be to assess all these different things. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Another, another question? You have probably 10 minutes. Five minutes is it okay? Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Okay. While well, waiting uh, for the other. Oh, moderator. Yeah. Moderator, yeah. could, I, could, I, could I please ask one more question yeah. dealing with yeah. TQ English 4 test itself? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so actually, um, our institution uh, has already a cooperation like in 2021, mm -hmm. uh, last year actually. But Tony knows that. Um, but uh, we just, um, you know, offer that to our student, and uh, uh, we don't make it as a requirement for the students to um, take it. So they can uh, go to the uh, like, uh, you know, the website, and then they can um, simply take it if they want to, depending on their uh, their own purposes. So it's not a requirement for our institution for the students to take the uh, the English score test. But we do had has actually still because I um it is a three year um a uh, kind of a cooperation if I'm not mistaken at time uh, but Tony probably know still knows that right but Tony if you're still here um but uh, there, there is one question that I'd like to ask dealing with the contents of the test uh if you like um so uh dealing with the content um um I was just wondering if it is a global ones or uh if a uh, it, it is uh, from Europe, of course, from uh, from the the UK. Uh, if we compare it with, with for example, TOEFL, they, uh, their content, uh, for instance, in the reading test, uh, will reflect uh, you know uh, the information dealing with the the uh, USA. Uh, now, what about the English core? Uh, does it also reflect um, the content of the um, Europe European countries in this world? in this case uh, the 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 UK or probably. Um, it also covers, you know, like the content from uh, uh, Asian countries as well. Or, yeah, so that's the, uh, one thing that I would like to know, dealing with the content of, for example, the um, reading test and also the um, uh, listening test in this case. Thank you very much, Fabian and uh, moderator. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so although, you know, we, we're based in the UK um, um, and we are the British Council. English score is very much a global test. Um, and so we, we use none of, none of our items, none of our test is based on knowledge of the UK. Um, and we try and reflect the different countries that the English score is working in. So if I give you a very simple example, um, we were this is probably around a year ago now, we were writing a, a fairly simple um, speaking item um, for, I think it was A2. Um, and we wanted them to talk about, we were going to show them a menu in a restaurant. And um, we we're talking about what food do we put on the menu that they could talk about as part of their, their spoken, as measuring their spoken ability. And what we didn't want to do was have very British food. Um, you know, so you may have typically British food of maybe a sandwich for lunch or something like that, which fine, everyone knows and understands, but that doesn't really reflect how we use our test in that global global sense. So we decided, well, let's, let's, let's go more global. Let's have something like rice and chicken as one example dish that we could use that will be familiar to a lot of our test takers. Um, so it'll be things like that of making sure that we're not just purely UK focused, um, and the same thing with our, our listing items, you know, we don't want to be using only British speakers of English. Um, we want to ensure that we get both, um, well, we get a range of different accents, um, both within the UK, but also outside the UK. Um, and I'm very keen as well to, to include non-native speakers of English as well as part of our listing items, as part of our prompts. You will see in our speaking test as well that we are actually using, uh, we've, we've asked, non-native speakers um, of English to be in our speaking test videos. And, and if you're familiar with our speaking test, you'll know that they ask questions to the people taking our test. And we, we've asked non-native speakers of English to record those videos. We think it's really important that our test reflects the context that is being used, which is global, um, and that 
we are not focused purely on a UK or, or British um, context. So you can see that in this call already sort of first the cultural very quick, right? <laughs> not <Yeah>. only UK <laughs> based, but not only UK based text or uh, listening material, but other languages, uh, other uh, accent here. And I, yeah, I think it's just it's just fair for test takers, right? We shouldn't be asking test takers to learn about British culture as well right. as learning English. Right. That's just right. extra burden for them. So let, let's make it simple and straightforward and use things that are familiar with. That, thank you for the answer. My, yeah, thank, thank you, you Adriani, for the question too. That's thank answering you. my question as well. So, previously, I would like to ask whether when we design a, a listening test, it will it be okay if we use non native speakers as a narrator or voiceover uh, in the test material? When we when we choose this kind of talent or, or narrator, what kind of specific criteria that probably we can learn from the English course? Uh, to choose this kind of talent? Is there any specific criteria? Um, I think, I mean, again, I think the CFR is really useful when it comes to this, um, making these decisions, right? So if you are going to be using, um, well, anyone, actually native or non-native, you need to make sure that um, they're going to be understandable, that they will be globally comprehensible. And I think that's the key phrase. It doesn't matter what accent you have. It doesn't matter uh, where you're from. Um, as long as you are globally comprehensible. Um, so, um, you know, there will be parts of the UK um, where people's accents are very strong. They will be speaking English, but very challenging, even for myself as a as a, someone born in the UK, be quite difficult for me to understand. I will have to say, I can slow down and I will be acting almost like an A2, B1 learner. So slow down, please, so I can understand what you're saying. And this is native speaker to native speaker. So when it comes to selecting the people that you want to use in your listing items or your spoken items, they need to be globally comprehensible. And I think the CEFR is a good way to, to look at that You can say, well, you know, speakers should be C1 and above, for example, the CEFR scale. And I, if they're C1 and above, then I'm happy to use them um, in my questions. You may say, well, actually, C1 is not high enough. They need to be C2. So they need to be at that really proficient um, level before I want to use them. Um, so. Yes, I, I think the CFR can help you decide that. But I think, as I say, for me, the key thing is globally comprehensible. Can you be understood by anyone anywhere in the world? Um, and I think that's that's really important. Again, we shouldn't be putting kind of barriers and that will make the test very unfair. If you are very familiar with a particular accent, you will have an advantage over someone who is not when you're taking the test. All right, thank you for that. Thank you for the answer. Last question. Uh, in terms of specific question step, uh, for your information, some of the field members has already developed their own home ground tests about them. And then some others are already developed until the uh, question uh, development, uh, question development. I mean, already create one or two packets of tests while yeah. the others are still designing the test item specification. At this point, uh, what is your suggestion? Uh, when, when we like to repeat to the specification step to uh, it, to align, to check whether we are in the correct level of CFR. And in other words, how do we do self-review to our test? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, good and good question. I think um, the process that I've outlined today, those five key steps, um, can apply when you are developing a new test or when you're looking at an, an existing test. So it doesn't, this doesn't only apply to new tests. If you do have an existing test, or even if you're halfway through creating a test, you can still use these steps. Um, that may uncover things about your test. It may tell you things, well, actually, I need to change my test design slightly. You know, if we go back to when we were looking at those reading items, linking my items to the descriptors in the CEFR, I may find, well, actually, the items that I've developed so far don't match up so well, and I need to change something about them. That may not be completely changing them or, or re, you know, rejecting them completely. It may just be making slight changes to the text or slight changes to the question type. The key thing is you don't need to follow this process um, <clears throat> only for new tests. If you do have existing tests, and many companies do this, many kind of testing companies will take your existing tests and link them back to the CFR after they've designed it. 
Um, ideally, you do this at the beginning because it can save you some work further down the line. But if not, no problem, you can do it. The only thing I would say is just make sure you go through all the stages. I think that's really important. If you skip a stage, if you skip that initial familiarization, everything else then starts to become quite difficult to do, quite difficult to justify. And by the time you get to that fifth stage of validation, it's very difficult to present your argument and justify why you've made the decisions if you haven't followed the steps. But yeah, short answer, no issues with applying this to your existing or in, pro in progress tests. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Fabian, for answering all of the questions and for the great presentation. It was a pleasure to have you with us. And then to end this webinar, let me cite uh, one of Chinese proverbs from Lao Tzu. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. It, it means that it is not to demotivate us, of course, but to encourage us to start thinking and working with our tests and reevaluate and uh, repeat the whole process to create a, a better, of course, with the version of the test. So to, to conclude this webinar, thank you for everyone to attend this uh, webinar today. We hope that we can learn something and enjoy the presentation. And don't forget to fill the attendance list provided in the chat feature to get the ES certificate and uh, uh, certificate of attendance, of course, and the other is uh, you will get a free certificate of English score worth uh, to twenty dollar, yeah, uh, provided by Tony from the Wisconsin School. Thank you very much for all of your participation and enthusiasm. Uh, close to the of the afternoon. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Bapak Toyibi, Ibu sekalian. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Benjamin Cook, as the speaker today. It's such a great presentation. And thank you for Mas Dama for the awesome, awesome moderator today. Yeah, the last but not least, thank you for everyone for attending today's webinar. Hopefully, the explanation today will give an advantage for us. Yeah, if you have any questions, please contact Philba WhatsApp. And on behalf of Philba and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and have a great day. Goodbye. Wabilai Taufiq Waidaya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Goodbye. Waalaikumsalam. Bye, Bye Mbak Dini. Thank you for your very kind support, Father. Bye. Bye. See you, everyone. See you. 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 See you.